Good afternoon. It's 1.30 on March 11th. We're here for the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. We have two items on our agenda, the first of which is the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission's FY25-30 to 30 Capital Improvements Program. We have the Planning Board Chair, the Parks Director, Park Staff uh, with us today, and Council Staff along with Office of Management and budget, I believe, as well. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and with that, why don't I turn it over to Ms. Dunn to uh, walk us through the packet and turn it over to our colleagues in parks and planning and uh, also to the executive branch at the appropriate time. Great. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, so we are here today. We're going to be covering the entire parks CIP request for this budget cycle. Um, and it's somewhat of a lengthy staff report, but we're going to go through it um, page by page. Um, as we get about halfway through, you'll see that um, several of the PDFs that are in that section are for consent, and so those will go a little quicker. Um, and I'll also just mention at the start, there is an affordability reconciliation PDF that's been included in the CE's budget. Um, where uh, the board has recommended a potential change based on that affordability, it's noted in the staff report as we go through each PDF. Um, but I think logistically it makes sense to cover that as a whole at the end of the work session. So with that, um, you'll see on the first page is really just summary. We do it every year. It um, really shows uh, for the committee, the council, and the community um, what the current CIP uh, approved is, what the request is, and where the executive branch has come in um, related to those amounts. Uh, but we will cover this in more detail. Uh, the staff report is laid out which the first section, we're just going to talk about some general issues. Um, there's one I'm going to mention verbally that's not in here um, written, but you'll get to that in a minute. The second section is about new projects. The third, um, changes to existing projects. So this is where a funding source has changed, timing has changed, uh, request of funding amount has changed. Um, the next section, I call it a consent section in the sense that either there's been no change to the funding, it's a specific project, a development project, uh, with certain funding and that's not changing in this six years or it's an ongoing project where the additional two years of fiscal funding in the CIP are at level funding. They don't, they don't increase or decrease. Um, following that, you'll see a, a list of projects that are not recommended for funding during the six-year period. This is usually because they're going to be closed out. Um, and then last is the section that will probably take us some time uh, with input from parks, the board, and OMB, and this is where we'll have a long discussion about what to do about the reconciliation PDF. Um, so with that, unless anyone has any questions, I'll jump into general issues. Okay, the first one's very simple. Um, there is a project description forms for planned life cycle asset replacement. There is one for local parks, and there is one for non-local parks. And until this CIP, within those two broad categories, there have been subcategories of projects and the funding um, of the broader uh, PLAR, as we like to refer to it as an acronym, um, gets dispersed through those subprojects. And what OMB and the board and park staff have determined is that it is uh, probably more efficient to go back to having just the large PLAR non-local park and PLAR local park PDFs only and not break them out by those subcategories. Um, council staff suggests that's a good recommendation for efficiency and reduces the number of PDS to track. Any concerns from parks? Any concerns from the executive branch? No. Oh. Uh, well, you want to just hit your mic real quick and say that for the record, just so anybody watching can hear you? No, no, press the button to you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank it. you. Uh, my name is Bibi Nicole OMB. Uh, OMB does not have any concerns with consolidating the PDFs because um, it was a, a discussion during the uh, at CIP, last year's CIP. Thank Great. You. All right. Well, let's move forward then. Great. Thank you. Um, the next one has to do with two PDFs uh, projects. One is for pollution prevention and the other is for stream protection. Um, and there are two recommended changes here. One is there's a recommendation to change the funding source, and this is to move from long-term financing from the Department of the Environment um, and replace that with water quality protection bonds. Um, the result of this change would mean that in FY24, long-term financing funding is going to get pushed into FY25. Um, 3.2 million of that uh, is 
attributed to the pollution prevention PDF, um, and about 4.2 million to the uh, stream protection. If you have any questions about that, okay. Uh, the next one is just um, alerting to anyone reading the staff report, the public, that the affordability reconciliation um, project description form has been included in the CE's budget. Um, in response, park staff met with the board, and the board has put forward um, what we term its non-recommended reductions. How would it meet that cut to what it's proposed as the CIP that it needs for its mission um, and to maintain the park system? Um, my suggestion is, while I summarize it here, that we cover that at the end of today's um, staff report so that you can see what's recommended for funding for all projects before having a broad discussion on cutting. Sounds good. Let's do that. Um, and then lastly, which I didn't include here, but I should note, um, and was noted uh, somewhere else in the staff report, um, the planning department had been working with the Department of Transportation in um, a memorandum of understanding to transfer um, an account that covers uh, maintenance and snow removal. Yes, it's our Parks Road projects. Right. Um, and um, the Director of Parks can talk more to that, um, but it was something that was sent over with the uh, Parks proposed CIP um, when the CE put out his budget, uh, didn't include the transfer of funding um, with the comment that the, the conversations were ongoing. I know that the committee has received a letter. Um, indicating that Parks is still very supportive of having this transfer for a lot of efficient reasons. Um, and if you'd like to have them speak to that, we can do that now or we can do it at the end of the presentation today. We can, we can wait till the end if that's easier. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're going to move on. Um, so the next section are new projects. There are only two new projects recommended in this CIP. One is an acquisition project. This is uh, to acquire parkland. And it is the Silver Spring Park Benefit Payment Project Description Form. Um, and again, this is to collect funds in the downtown Silver Spring area in support of that master plan that was approved about a year and a half ago. Uh, and the council staff suggests the committee support this new project. That objection. Okay. The next uh, second new project, this one is a development project, and it's the Littonsville Civic Green. Uh, this one was one that the council received testimony on, highly in support of this project. Um, it, it will serve as a rest stop with amenities along the Capitol Crescent Trail and the Purple Line light rail system, providing environmental benefits and highlighting the character and the history of Littonsville. Uh, and council staff suggests that the committee support this project as well. Important project and we support without objection. Great. Uh, the next, um, so this is the section where we're going to go over all the projects that are recommended for a change um, and we'll cover them in two different groups. We want to cover acquisition projects first. These are obviously the ones that are about um, maintaining and getting parkland. Um, the second about development projects. So the first one here is ALARF, the Advanced Land Acquisition Revolving Fund. Um, and the increase in funding here um, is due to anticipated future revenue. The ALARF account has an annual funding from tax receipts that are added to the fund every year. The new funds into this account um, are currently running around $2.1 million per year. So this would account for that. Without objection. Okay. The next are Bethesda Park Impact Payments PDF. Um, and this is again, it's an acquisition account to collect money for park, uh, park land in the Bethesda area. Um, the increase in funds for FY25 and 26 represent ongoing approvals of projects required to contribute to this fund. The staff suggests we support this as well. Appreciate it. This just reflects the money we're expecting to receive from the approvals. So uh, we support. I have lots to say about this, but I will <laughs> yeah. hold my tongue and we'll continue. Yeah. Um, the next is legacy open space. Um, and this request includes a slight decrease over the six years due to the addition of two fiscal years at level funding through their use of GO bonds and current revenue, um, which are being slightly offset by a decrease across the six years via a transfer of MNCPPC bond funding from the legacy open space to the legacy urban space. And we'll cover that next. So it's just a very slight decrease, but it is a change in funding as well. So I wanted to note that for the committee. Um, and staff suggests the committee support this change. Without objection. Great. Um, and as I mentioned, the next one is the legacy urban space. Um, and this request adds two fiscal years at level funding of about $3.5 uh, per year and transfers 
the MNC PPC bond funding from the legacy open space. And council staff su suggest the committee support this change as well. Without objection. Okay. Um, and the next group we're now going to cover are those development projects. The first one is energy conservation for non-local parks. Um, it's only a, it's an increase of 100,000 per year in FY25 and through 28, and two fiscal years of funding are added at the higher amount. Um, it, it's not a huge change, but it does support our energy conservation goals and climate action plan, uh, and council staff suggests the committee support this change. Without objection. Okay. The next is the enterprise facility improvements. Uh, there's a change in cost due to an increase in the scope of work, um, including improvements to the Little Bennett Campground and an ice refrigeration system at Cabin John at Wheaton Ice Arenas. Um, and council staff suggests the committee support this increase too. Without objection. All right. Next are park refreshers. Um, and as you'll recall, these are uh, funds that are set aside for projects uh, that are usually between one and three million. They don't require a full separate PDF for the project. Um, but, but they are needed to improve our park system. The request here increases the MNC PPC bond funding um, and adds two fiscal years at the higher funded level. The six-year funding is just slightly lower than the current CIP due to the impact of current state and federal funding which this project has received, hopefully will receive in the future. Um, and then council staff suggests the committee support this funding. Without objection. Okay. Uh, the next are planned life cycle asset replacement for local parks. Again, this is the the broader category will be the only PDF for this um, life cycle asset for local parks. The request includes a modest increase in MNCPPC bond funding in 27 and 28 to address the rising uh, renovation costs and a growing list of candidate projects and adds two fiscal years um, to this ongoing project. The six-year funding is just slightly lower than the current CIP. Again, this is due to the impact of state, fund, state aid that we currently have for this. The council received testimony advocating for the continued funding for park amenities, both new and replacement and renovated amenities such as play equipment and courts. Um, and this applies to both this and then the next uh, PDF we'll cover as well. And council staff support, suggests the committee support the funding. Without objection. Okay. Uh, and the next one is the life cycle asset replacement for non-local parks. Um, the initial funding request here included an increase in both geo bond funding and current revenue funding to reflect the increased costs and a growing candidate list of infrastructure projects for our larger non-local parks. The two additional fiscal years to this ongoing project are added at the higher funding level request. Um, the board modified this project in response to the CE's affordability reconciliation PDF, reducing current revenue general by about seven point nine, almost eight million dollars. This reduction basically keeps the funding of PLAR non-local at about the current funding level, retaining a slight increase in geobond funding. Uh, staff suggests that we discuss all modifications related to the affordability reconciliation um, at the end of review. Agreed. Okay. We'll keep going. Uh, pollution prevention and repairs, as mentioned earlier, this um, is in this section of changed PDFs because it has a change in funding source from long-term financing to water quality protection bonds and water quality protection current revenue. Um, and it also shifts money from FY24 into 25. Yeah, just a quick question on the shifting of the money from 24 to 25. Is that reflective of the funding that's been utilized up to this point and wanting to shift it over to FY25 when it would um, be utilized? Is this, Andy can you just Frank, explain um, that a little bit? I believe uh, that was ONB in the reconciliation of the accounting uh, because right now we're in a, a loan-based program. So we have an individual loan that's active right now that's about $4.7 million. And there's a crossover into a larger loan that's about $15 million loan. And I believe what they, the goal was not to uh, accept the $15 million loan and they had to shift some of the money around. It doesn't reflect the change in the projects or in the timing of the projects. All right, so this is an accounting change, yeah. essentially, where the source of funds is and the timing that reflects yeah. that source of funds. Could you just confirm that? Pranika Hawa from OMB. Yeah, that's a technical change. It doesn't change the total cost of the project, but it just moves the funds that are unspent to FY25 where they're going to be spent. Got it. Okay, thanks for clarifying. That's what I thought, but I just wanted it to be... Stated for the record, uh, I, without objection, we'll take that one and let's move forward. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, stream protection is very similar. Again, this one is um, requesting the same change in funding source from long-term financing to water quality protection bonds, uh, and again, has money, a technical adjustment that is shifting funds from FY24 into 25. And just note for the committee that this project is in support of the ongoing work that the Parks Department does toward the county's MS4 permit. It does have the addition of two fiscal years at a slightly higher requested amount, but again, this is again needed to support the MS4 permit that the county must provide. Several um, council members enjoyed uh, joining DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, for their stream restoration projects. This is a collaborative effort where DEP has their part of this and uh, the Parks Department has uh, a separate part of it, but it's all part of the same stream valley and all part of the same uh, MS4 application process. and. Uh, the need to meet those uh, environmental standards, federal and state standards as well. Are we safe to assume this is the same as the previous item where it doesn't change uh, the projects themselves, it merely is a shift of the funding source and a technical change to the timing? Yes, that's correct. Great. Okay. Without objection, we'll take that as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next project we're going to cover are trails, hard surface, design and construction, PDF. The initial funding request for this included a $2 million increase in geo bond funding. Um, this reflects an increase in construction costs and the need to supplement the use of federal aid awarded under the Safe Streets for All program. The additional uh, fiscal years, two fiscal years that are added to the project were added at a, the higher funding level. And again, this is one that the board modified in response to the affordability reconciliation PDF, so we can discuss that later. Yep, I have concerns about this. I know we'll have a robust discussion. This committee has historically been very supportive of restoring surface trail funding. Um, I will say, you know, the planning board has to make tough decisions when the funding is not available uh, as determined by the county executive in his capital budget. Uh, but obviously seeing trails, which I think are some of our most important and cost effective community resources is something that uh, we've taken a close look at. So we'll get to that later, uh, so let's continue. Okay. Um, and probably the next two PDFs will be in that exact same category. The next one is Trails, a hard surface renovation PDF. Um, the initial funding request here included a significant increase in geo bond funding. According to park staff, the majority of the request, requested increase was to be used for matching funds to support the RAISE grant, which was awarded to rehabilitate and resurface Sligo Creek Trail from University Boulevard to through the county line to Prince George's. Um, the grant provides partial funding for intended projects with the remaining funding coming from local sources. Um, and we can cover this again when we get to the end. Sounds good. Okay. And then lastly, Trails, a natural surface and resource-based recreation PDF. Uh, the initial funding request here included a $3 million increase in current revenue funding, um, and we'll discuss this as we discuss what to do with that reconciliation. Agreed. Ditto to what I said earlier for this <laughs> item as well. Uh, okay, we're on page 14 of the staff report, and we are on Vision Zero project. Uh, the initial funding request here for this project included a $2.5 million increase in geo bond funding, with a portion of this increase to be used to supplement federal aid awarded under the Safe Streets for All program. And again, the two additional fiscal years funded at the slightly higher level. Um, and we'll discuss this at the end. Sounds good. Uh, and then Wheaton Regional Park improvements. Again, uh, the initial funding request for this project um, includes an increase of almost $12 million in geo bond funding. The increase is due to work needed to implement the Wheaton Regional Park Master Plan elements. Um, it was, again, one of the projects affected by the reconciliation PDF. All right. Uh, we're on section four. These are projects for approval by consent. We can look at each one of these um, or kind of quickly go through page by page. But what I'll say is I think for three or four of these, um, they are projects for a specific park project, in which case if they're in this section, there was no change in funding at all. If they are ongoing projects, they were requests for addition of two fiscal years at level funding, no change in um, increased costs at all, uh, just two additional years. I would just suggest at a high level, just quickly go through all of them together, mm -hmm. and then we can take it up as a block since okay. so, it's a major discussion point, but uh, we're approving right. you know, consensus uh, that already exists, and there were no significant changes here, but I think it's important to just right. know what the projects are. Sure. So uh, there's some that are under acquisition projects. Again, these aren't development. They're acquisition for parkland. One is the Mid-County Park Benefit Payments. There were no changes in this funding cycle. The other were Park Acquisitions PDF. 
This was the one that requested two additional years at level funding. Those are the only acquisition ones. The next are development projects, uh, ADA compliance for local parks, and ADA compliance for non-local parks. Both requested level funding um, at the current rate. Ball field initiatives um, and the Bethesda lots 10 through 24, both of these projects on page 18 also request two additional years of funding um, at the same amount as currently funded. Um, if we turn to the next page, you have cost sharing for local parks and cost sharing for non-local parks and the energy conservation PDF for local parks. These are all funded at the same amount as they're currently being funded in the CIP. Uh, if you turn to page 20, for facility planning for local parks and facility planning for non-local parks, again, requesting level funding at two additional years because these are ongoing projects. Minor new construction for local parks and minor new construction for non-local parks. Again, their requests are for level funding um, for the two additional fiscal years in the CIP. You have the Northwest Branch Recreational Park Athletic Area. Um, which was no change in uh, the requested design and construction funding for FY28. Ovid Hazen Wells Recreational Park, no request to change in its funding. The Powerline Trail, um, there was no change in its funding request. Restoration of historic structures, uh, this was the addition of two fiscal years at level funding. South Germantown Recreational Park Cricket Field, no requested change in funding. Small donor. Small grant donor assisted capital improvements uh, requesting two additional years of level funding and urban park elements, um, two additional years at level funding for this project. And that covers all of the projects included in that grouping um, without significant change. Great, okay, without objection. Uh, yeah, let me turn it to Council Madrona. I just wanna note the obvious here that even though there's consent, there's a lot of really good stuff in here and, and you know that a few years ago didn't exist you know the cricket fields and the ball fields the money and stuff that I'm really happy to see that's providing great benefit to the community that there's now widespread agreement that we need to continue so uh, really appreciate that thanks for lifting that up and here here I think it also speaks to a lot of the work in the previous committee the the, the Fed committee with Councilmember Reamer and Councilmember Juando uh, and, and, and me really working towards building a foundation where those are consensus items that uh, they were fights and debates and discussions previously that were hard fought and now they're consensus which I think is a great reflection of the progress we've made in parks funding. We still have work to do to restore some funding here and it's a, a, a chronic uh, challenge that we have but I think it's important to note the, the progress that we've made where you know, we have laid the foundation uh, previously to get us to a place of broad consensus here, although not universal consensus. So let's continue. Great, thank you. Uh, we're on section five of the staff report, which are projects not recommended for funding. Um, these either have, um, they're either pending closeout, they are being closed out for sure, or there's no funding in the six years. It may only be either in the beyond the six years um, or neither in this current cycle or the six years beyond. Uh, if you have any questions about any of those specific ones, happy to answer them, but they all made sense. They were recommended by Parks. Um, okay, so lastly. Okay, just, I'll just oh, note, they're, they're listed on page 25 of the packet uh, for anybody who's watching. Uh, we don't need to go through them because for the issues that you stated and they're going away and they're going away for good reason, uh, largely because they're being closed out, but I uh, did just want to note that. Okay, thank you. Um, and so now, uh, Section 6, the Executive's Affordability Reconciliation PDF, um, the Executive in his recommended FY25 through 30 CIP includes an affordability reconciliation PDF, which reduces current revenue expenditures by almost $11 million and GO expenditures by 13.2 million. Um, there's a table at the bottom of page 25 of the staff report that shows not just the total six year reductions that I've mentioned, but the amount of reductions being recommended for each of the fiscal years within the CIP. Um, in the next page, we have information about uh, the board's um, Response to that, on February 8th, the park staff and the board identified non-recommended reductions to the requested CIP um, to meet this reconciliation PDF, and we can go through each of those. I don't know if this is a good time to turn it over to OMB to make comments about the executive's PDF or Do you want to go funding. through them first, or do you want to Either turn way, it to them? It's the board. It's the will of the committee. Why don't we go through them first, and then we'll turn it to OMB to give the overarching rationale okay, afterwards sure. so that we have the context of 
the what, and then we'll hear the why, and then we can discuss sure. what now. <laughs> Absolutely. So table one, um, these are the reductions to geo bond expenditures to meet the affordability uh, reconciliation PDF. And so what you'll see here is there are four projects being um, addressed here to, to make that uh, reconciliation. Trails, hard surface design and construction, trails, hard surface renovation, Vision Zero, and Wheaton Regional Park improvements. And what you'll see for each one, for each of the fiscal years, you'll see the um, current amended CIP, and then you'll see the request from parks, the initial request from parks for 25 through 30. You'll see the adjustment that the board has um, put forward, and then the revised FY 25 through 30 funding level that is that remains as a request um, in this CIP. And so for trails, hard surface, and design, uh, an adjustment by $250,000 for the last four years of the CIP. Um, this reduction, it still retains about a 29% increase over the current CIP um, for six-year funding for this project. Uh, trails, hard surface, and renovation, you'll see that um, each of the fiscal years is reduced um, in the first year by a million, um, and in the subsequent years, FY26 through 30, by about a half a million. Um, but over the six-year period, this PDF still retains about a 40% increase over the current six years. For Vision Zero, you can see there that the adjustments are made in the last four years of the CIP, um, and the remaining amount uh, requested to be funded is $750,000 compared to the current $500,000 it's being funded at in the last four years of this CIP. Um, so that's retaining about a 50% increase over the six-year period. And then lastly, Wheaton Regional Park improvements. Um, for this one, you can see that the current CIP is um, relatively modest at $800,000 um, to as much as $2 million. Um, the request for FY25 through 30 um, was quite a significant jump. Um, so the adjustment is also quite large and brings you down to the level you see on the bottom, uh, F revised FY25 through 30. Um, I don't know if you'd like to talk about these geo bond ones first and then talk about the current revenue or take them up as a whole. Let's do, let's uh, go through current revenue. Go through current revenue. Sure. If you turn the page, you'll see the reductions to current revenue expenditures. Um, two projects are, are affected here. It is the um, plan life cycle asset replacement for non local parks. Um, for this one, uh, you can see the current. Uh, amended CIP, the re initial request from the board, the adjustment, and then the revised. This only retains about a 2% increase over the current CIP. It's almost level funding. And Trails, Natural Surface, and Resource Based Recreation, um, the cut here basically brings this project back to the current level of funding. It's a, a level funded project, no increase. Um, and then um, in addition to providing these projects and these amounts for these years, the board also put forward um, if the committee and the council has the ability to restore funding for any of these projects, uh, they put forward two tiers of requests. The first tier um, you can see is on the bottom of page 27. Um, and it would restore, I think, uh, 70% of the proposed reduction in geo bond funding and about 84% of the reduction in current revenue. If you were to restore also tier two, which is much smaller, um, you would basically eliminate the affordability reconciliation PDF. Um, and then on the last page of the staff report are just some options for the committee to consider, uh, but that's part of a broader discussion. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that overview for this exhaustive packet, uh, for all the work of the planning board and the parks department to try to navigate through the proposed cuts and how to prioritize uh, with that. Let me turn it over to the executive branch. You can share the, the broader context and the rationale behind the reductions, and then we will begin a discussion. Sure. Thank you. Again, Veronica Hawa from OMB. So I just want to provide the fiscal context for the CIP. Um, as you know, geo, geo bonds are flat. There are significant reductions in recordation tax um, due to low levels of sales, um, significant cost increases in many projects across all CIP, all categories and subcategories due to inflation and market pressures. Um, 
non-local funding sources uh, such as state aid and federal aid are not as robust as used to be in the last couple of years. And prior structural um, under budgeting for MCPS and in, in the MCPS CAP and being front loaded presented um, significant challenges in reconciling the CAP that caused uh, many projects that were already approved to be delayed or reduced. Um, and even though the um, Cultural and Education Committee or Education and Cultural Committee are fixing these, are trying to correct these structural deficiencies, it is very likely that this uh, CIP budget cycle is going to be still very difficult. I'm sure the Education and Culture Committee Chair appreciates the acknowledgement uh, and appreciate the, 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 the broader context provided. Um, why don't we turn to the Chair of the Planning Board and the Parks Department for your thought process of how you approached the non-recommended cuts, what you prioritize, what concerns that you have in terms of the impact of the decisions that are being made and then we'll have a committee discussion here. And we do have three thoughtful suggestions. Uh, we don't have to go with one of these three, but I think it gives us a really good framework. And so I appreciate council staff for giving us a, 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 a guidepost and a framework with which to operate uh, off of to try to get to a consensus before we move forward. So with that, Mr. Chair, yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, committee president, chairman, and, and other members of the committee, I'm, I'm happy, really delighted to be here with you today and key members of the park staff to advocate for our CIEP budget and answer any questions. I'd like to turn it over to Parks Director Figueroa to go over the technical uh, parts about why we chose what we did and and and, and she has her, her, her really great staff here to go to work with us on this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris, and thank you, Council President Friedson and members of the of the committee. I, I want to share with you what our thinking was when we brought um, our recommendation to the Planning Board for its approval. We didn't ask for large increases across the board in our capital budget. We understand that there are constraints. So we targeted our requested increases primarily um, to uh, equity areas. Um, and to projects that we know have a big impact and about which we heard quite a bit from the, com from the community. So primarily the largest increase was for Wheaton Regional Park. This is a park that's 64 years old. It's in an equity area. It is a very well-loved park. It is highly visited. Its infrastructure is aging and we have a recently approved uh, master plan that recommends a number of improvements to the park. And so that was a major priority for us in requesting a geo bond increase. In addition, for our hard surface trail projects, both design and construction and renovation, as well as Vision Zero, we appropriated um, federal grants, the RAISE grant and the Safe Streets for All. I will take a moment to say that um, Safe Streets for All in particular serves a broader community benefit rather than just a pure parks benefit. It's in coordination with things like Safe Routes to School and with other DOT projects and it has a, a very big impact but in order to move those projects forward um, we asked for additional funding so that we would not displace other projects that are also in the queue for funding through those programs. For example, through the Hard Surface Trails renovation project, we're going to see improvements to the Rock Creek Trail, which is very old and needs a lot of work. Um, our Natural Surface Trails requested increase in current revenue um, was based really, uh, we heard at the planning board hearing for the um, capital budget such an outcry. Um, from uh, trails users and our natural surface trails program is probably one of the most cost efficient things that we can invest in. It's really just the people who actually implement the projects and we do a lot of them in partnership with community groups like MORE. And so we get a 
real impact very quickly and those projects um, really hit all of our parks priorities which as you know include community engagement outdoor exercise and environmental stewardship so these were the focus of our requested increases and then of course when we received um, the affordability PDF from the county executive we had to take um, reductions in all those categories in Wheaton Regional Park that was the biggest hit that we took because it was the biggest increase because we really need those funds in order to implement those projects but both of our hard surface trail projects our vision zero um, our natural surface trail project and our PILAR um, all would take a hit from this um, affordability PDF and I'm happy to answer any more questions about that or elaborate on any of that yeah I appreciate it I uh, recently spoke to more at their annual meeting and we heard overwhelming support during the public testimony and uh, to your point uh, the leveraging particularly on natural surface trails of community volunteer I mean this is a very cost-effective investment probably more so than any other parks investment that we make because we are leveraging community sweat equity as opposed to uh, actual you know hard capital dollars uh, in terms of the improvements that we're able to make so uh, we we have supported that before uh, in terms of restoring it it seems to be frequently on the chopping block unfortunately uh, we've made huge advances over the last 15 years uh, particularly over the last you know five to seven years in uh, natural surface trails and notwithstanding I've been a volunteer for a temporary period of time uh, but uh, uh, other people who actually do it are talented and uh, do a great job. Uh, President company absolutely excluded, uh, but it's a it's a huge benefit. And, and clearly, uh, Wheaton Regional Park uh, is of significant concern, central to our equity goals, central to you know fulfilling the pros plan. Um, and I know we have the the, the Wheaton. Uh, representative and district council member here who I'm sure has some strong thoughts on that as well before turning it to colleagues could you just explain the practical impact on the various items that you mentioned on the three different priority or options that council staff has put forward and then on uh, what the uh, planning board is recommending as non recommended cuts just so it's clear for for everybody in terms of what would be restored what would still not be available well if we received our full requested increase for Wheaton Regional Park for example we would start with implementation of the action sports um, project which is part of a full renovation of the Rubini complex and associated with that um, action sports project uh, we have other improvements um, that we would do alongside that including parking lot improvements including bathrooms um, it, it has a delaying it has kind of a knock-on effect so if we got all the funding we would probably be able to implement all of the recommendations um, within about 10 years um, with a uh, with the county executives reduction if we had to take that we're looking at turning 10 years into 20 years if we got some of that funding back as we requested um, in tier one for example of our of our requested tier restoration we could probably turn we would still see some kind of delay but we'd be talking about maybe turning tw 10 years into 12 or so so even just restoring a portion of that would really help us move forward with those projects and then with our hard surface trail projects our design and construction and renovation because we have to implement the raise grant and the safe streets for all that means that some other projects like for example the Rock Creek trail renovation would be delayed um, on the current revenue side you know natural surface trails what we plan to do with some of that money was do some bridge projects um, and also expand we have about 200 miles of natural surface trails and as you said it's very cost effective we're able to implement them very quickly um, and that would just mean we wouldn't be expanding uh, that, that that trail system or renovating those bridges as we had planned to do and then Pilar I mean this is almost a hundred year old park system everything is old and getting older and the PILAR helps us maintain our our park system so that it's um, you know uh, uh, still um, playable for uh, for county residents so that would just mean kind of again a backlog in projects 
um, that uh, make important fixes to our to our parks. Um, I'm going to see if um, Andy Frank wants to elaborate on any of that. Uh, thank you, Andy Frank. Uh, I head up the Park Development Division, and I, I would just like to reiterate the importance of the funding in different all the different realms. Uh, we did spend a lot of time putting together our initial uh, CIP request to the Planning Board, and we scrubbed it ourselves. It was not everything that everybody wanted within parks. Um, we obviously knew that there were, that there was going to be cost competition or funding competition across the county. And so when we went through our entire process, we were trying to be as agile, as efficient as we could. But uh, when we put together our, our proposal and it was approved by the planning board, we thought this is what the park system needs to advance, to maintain what we own, and uh, to really put a, an investment into Wheaton Regional Park, which we've talked about. Um, the uh, affordability PDF is really going to, to um, be difficult to maintain all those different programs and it does have a, a recurring effect where it will just delay and delay and delay and uh, that's why we've, we've come up with this two-tiered system for re uh, restoration. Um, obviously uh, getting the everything back would be the most wonderful thing, uh, however we know that this, that may not be uh, possible uh, given, the, given the climate and we've tried to prioritize the things where we think are as efficient as possible, deal with our infrastructure as best as possible, and deliver the best possible improvements to the equity areas as best we can. Um, so, and we thank you guys for consideration. Thank you. Okay, but just before we get into a discussion for council staff, Ms. Dunn, the difference between one and two, I just want to make it clear, because there's a lot of different numbers, that, mm -hmm. and for those who are following, could you just explain restoring tier one reductions is across the board restoring all of the tier one reductions that were the non-recommended reductions from the planning board. Option two, restore tier one funding, that's only for Wheaton Regional Park improvements and PILAR. Mm -hmm. And so do you want to explain mm -hmm. what the difference of those two options would be? what would be left out between option one and option two? Of course. And what the cost difference would be? Sure. Um, so if you, um, so right, the, the first recommendation, the first option would be to, re to restore the whole first tier, um, which as I mentioned would restore 70% of the geo bond funding cut and 84% of the current revenue cut. Um, if you restore uh, under option two, which would just be for Wheaton Regional Park and Pilar, um, this would satisfy about 81% of the requested funding for Wheaton. Okay, so um, while it would not 100% restore Wheaton, it would give the Wheaton Regional Park request 81.5% of what was uh, initially asked for. Um, and it would restore the PILAR non-local park, which is again, we think of our plan life cycle asset replacement, um, especially for our large regional parks, is you know, the way the park system maintains and keeps operating every year and providing quality to the community. It would not restore, in this request, it doesn't, um, option two does not include restoring funds for the hard surface design and construction, hard surface renovation, uh, vision zero, or the, well, we haven't talked about the current revenue. I guess it wouldn't also not restore the funding for the natural surface trails. Um, I will note that for the hard surface design and construction and the hard surface renovations, if you, you know, look at the amounts that are still being um, revised funding, um, they still retain significant increases over the current CIP. Um, again, as the directors mentioned, you know, there are these issues with uh, matching funds for some of the federal aid and state aid that's been received um, and being able to address all of these needs. Ms. Yeah, if I may. So just to add even more clarity um, to what council staff was just explaining. Um, I believe council staff's um, first, uh, first option is to restore all of our tier one reductions and then of course the second one is just the tier one for Wheaton Regional Park and Pilar. What that leaves out from our tier one is the uh, hard, trails hard surface renovation and natural surface trails current revenue. A portion of those we've requested that the um, committee and the council restore as part of tier one. Yeah, thank you for that, appreciate it. Uh, appreciate the options. I'll just put my cards on the table, turn to colleagues. I would like us to restore tier one. Uh, personally, I think it's important the 
Wheaton Regional Park restoration is very important uh, to the district council member, I know, certainly to all of us. It's uh, in an equity focus area and is a just hugely used and demanded asset. And we heard overwhelming support and uh, desire from the community for some of the other uh, uh, reductions that we would be looking to restore, particularly in the surface trail uh, uh, arena. So uh, with that, let me turn it to Councilmember Fani Gonzalez, and then I'll turn it to Councilmember Juanda. Thank you so much. Um, two things that I want to start with. Um, number one, we had, a, in my district, we had a youth town hall uh, about a month and a half ago, and some members of the park staff came uh, and joined that session. And we had about 150 kids from different high schools and middle schools. And every single kid in that town hall basically highlighted the need of having more places as teenagers to go and, you know, safe places to go. And when we talk about Wheaton Regional Park, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about those kids who don't have a place where they can have fun without being in the mall because even this is not me saying this is a mall but it's the kids said like, every time we go to the mall we're like pushed to buy stuff if we go to a park and we go to places where we can entertain ourselves we don't have that um pressure of buying the net sneakers or buying whatever clothes or spending money so understanding that's key the second thing that I want to say is this is also about economic development. Just this morning we had a, a session in the Economic Development Committee and the Council President was there where we talk about the importance of CIP projects and how they impact economic development in, in the county. So having these projects, having the investment into our park system, that also means attracting more investment into this county to have more housing, to have more jobs, and all that good stuff that we love talking about it, but we lack investment. So, um, so that's the second thing. And the other thing that I wanna emphasize, not only about economic development and having um, places for youth, but this is also about safety. When we talk about trails, creating more trails, is making sure that they're safe for people to ride. And riding on a trail, using your bike, as I do, is not just about recreation, it's also a mode of transportation where people use to get to jobs. So we also need to see this, not only as a parks budget, but as an economic development budget, as a transportation budget, as a recreational budget. Uh, as a health and human services budget. This is what it is. And um, I know we cannot have every single item that the Parks Department requested. I was on the planning board. Push it for crickets, for the cricket fields that then the council agreed on. Um, it takes a lot of work, and I know the planning board compromised to get us this tier one um, session. And um, I, I will also agree with the council president and say that I, I think we need to re restore fully the tier one um, reductions that we see here on page uh, 27. So number one recommendation from the county council. I'll yield back. Thank you, Councilmember Rwanda. All right, um, they set me up. Uh, no, no, uh, no, it's. Uh, so exactly that's what that's what that's what uh andrew said so um appreciate the acknowledgement of the work we're trying to do in education and culture to have truth in advertising here about what the cip is uh, and include funding for systemics and maintenance and things that are we've been paying for for a long time but that we tend not to put in the cip uh in lieu of large school projects and then that inevitably get delayed and people get disappointed. Uh, so uh, we're, we're working hard on that and that's gonna be a change, you know, since I've been on the council and for a long time and there are gonna be projects that people think are gonna happen that are we're just gonna say are not gonna happen. Large school projects. Um, and we're gonna have to grapple with that. And it is going to help, but it's gonna have an, an impact, I think, hopefully in a positive direction that we have to do that in all of the CIP and just be honest about what we can afford and when we can do it. Um, and then have a real conversation with our residents about what they want, you know, and how we uh, make sure we have the revenue to give them what they want. And, and there's only two ways to raise revenue 
It's through taxes and it's through expanding the tax base. Um, and we want to do both in, in a fair and progressive way. Um, and so I say all that to say, I, I think there are some really, we have, I've gotten into a pattern here of, uh, with, on the Fed, previous Fed committee and of restoring cuts to parks and planning that the executive has sent over. Um, I, I wanted to ask, one of the things I saw was a little different this year and Wheat not with Wheaton notwithstanding, is that overall the executive did increase many of these projects, right? So for from the current amended. You know, so if you look at trails, for example, it was you know, you, you talked about this, Ms. Dunn, in the in the opening, that there is a proposed increase of some amount, not to the the requested increase, but that these are the good news is they're all going to be increased in what in some at least at some a little bit is that correct? In the case of trails and vision, in, correct. Um, if you look at the page yeah. twenty twenty six, right, right, right. Yeah. where you yeah. see the revised funding, the board has still been able to maintain with the cut some still additional level of funding for those projects. Right. So like trails and hard surface, which we all know are super important. We found out big time in the pandemic, but everyone loves their trails here. Uh, you know, it was the, I think the executive was going up about a hundred thousand dollars, right, in each year on the current amounts, it's from six fifty to seven fifty, whereas the request was for a million, right, in those in each year, right. Um, and so I think it's just important to acknowledge that that we, there are while there are cuts from the request, they are increases over the current amended CIP, the current CIP, um, and we ha at the end of the day we have to make all these numbers fit. Um, and so anything, even if we approved restoration today, as you all know, it has to be subject to the full council and the overall, all the parts fitting together at the end of the day. And so we know, we know that process. Um, I'll speak about Wheaton first because Wheaton is a little bit of an outlier here in that as I read it, there are not really, uh, the executive did not really increase it at all. And, and so that's not appropriate. <laughs> and, and so you talked about, uh, Ms. Figueredo, about the timeline issue, the 10, 12, 20 years. Uh, my kids were just at Wheaton like last week, and I think I mentioned this to you guys when we, when we spoke. Uh, it gets a lot of use. There's a, we need more park benches. We need more. That is, you know, it's, a, it's something that the community greatly benefits from. Um, so there should be an increase there. The question is, you know, how much can we afford in this, uh, in this CIP? You've requested... It looks like uh, 35, 3.5 million, 4.5 million in 25 and 26, and then 3 million throughout the rest of the CIP. The executive uh, was well below that. Um, is there a way to, what is the, and I just want to make sure I understand, the tier one recommendation would restore how much of that in the case of Wheaton? Tier, our tier one request would be uh, would restore six point three million dollars of geo bonds and put those back toward Wheaton. It's not it's not a restoration of our entire Wheaton request. Right, six point three million out of. So how much of a restoration is that? I'm just trying to do the math. Miss Dunn, do you know? Uh, well, over whoever, the, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Over the six years, rather than by each year, it it. It yeah, provides funding for about 81% of what, what the request okay. was initially. Is there, again, these were nice examples, but like we could, we could do 50%, right? Like we, we don't, we could, there's another, we could do a different level, right? Um, I would be supportive of at least 50%, um, in, you know, restoration. I, I just am really concerned uh, about how we're going to make all these things fit. Um, and especially in light of, I say that, in light of the other things. And so is there any prioritization? Can you give us any prioritization of the prioritization in that? Do, do you really need the, the as much as possible on Wheaton as opposed to trails and hard surface? Again, you may get it. To, I'm just trying to get to 3.0 here. And, you know, obviously everything's based on what happens at full council. Go ahead. I'm thinking about how to answer your question. I, 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 you know, we would really, really like to push for at least out of the committee a recommendation for all of Tier 1. We understand how hard this is going to be for the council. We get it. Um, this, you know, the, the Parks Department's geo bond request is really very small. 
compared to the rest of the counties. It's maybe 5% of all the county geo bond funds. And what we're able to deliver to county residents with those geo bonds is, um, I think, impossible to replicate. So, uh, you know, I would, I continue to hope that we can get a recommendation for tier one, but I, I certainly understand the point you're making and whatever we get uh, out of this process at the end of all of it, we will use well. Um, we will spend it and we will deliver for your constituents and residents and we're just hoping that we can get as much as possible. I mean, it is very, it's, it, 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 it hurts to give up because we were so targeted in our right. initial request to the planning board. We really were very sensitive. We didn't want to spread everything out because then it's just you don't feel the impact the same way. Um, and it hurts to lose any of the natural surface trail funding, for example, um, because, you know, it has such a big impact and is so uh, uh, implementable. It you know hurts to lose um, any of the hard surface trail uh, funding because if you ride on some of our hard surface trails, you can see how much work they need. So again, very appreciative of whatever it is that you are able to restore. I do hope it's as much of at least tier one as we can reasonably yeah. ask for. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I Go ahead. Yeah, because yeah, sure. as uh, the board was really believed that in the pros plan how important Wheaton Regional Park was, and that we wanted to, even our tier one, even though it wasn't there wasn't much as the planning department one, it was to create some critical mass, get that project going, right? As Mitty said, if you fully funded, maybe ten years. If the, if you decrease it, you know, it just extends it going further. So we really wanted to give the best possible chance of getting region, regional park going with those pieces. No, understood. And I agree a, a thousand percent on Wheaton. It's just the, like I said, the when you combine it, and I know it's only, it's about $9 million, right, in in restoration. It, it all it all adds up. Um, and, uh, but I know you'll use it well, and you have used it well. Ms. Dunn, what was the, what did we, do you, this might be a hard for you to answer. What did we restore last year? Do you know that question? Oh, was it more or less? Was it higher, less or more than nine million? Well, I the the reduction, the requested reduction to the park ago. CIP yeah. was much smaller last year. Right. Uh, I think total their reduction was around ten million compared to this year's twenty four million. Right. Last so year. So it's yeah. hard to compare it's different. them. Yeah, it's different. Um. So yeah, I, I'll I'll go along with my colleagues. Um. I just if you could note, you know, just really, I think we do need to. Obviously, all this is subject to making the pieces fit. Um, and I do think, as you did note, it's important to note that, with the exception of Wheaton, that the other CEs were above the current uh, CIP. And we just need to know that when we're talking about it. You know, uh, the, other, the other categories were, you know, for us, the trails. Um, it's just we were just talking about how much of a reduction to, so it's how much of an increase of restoration so it can move quicker realizing there's a lot of need you never get to it quick enough i understand that so um so i'll go along with my colleagues well we always appreciate when colleagues have the courage and conviction to agree with us yes. so thank you for <laughs> joining uh, us on that i'll just note i think it's an important piece and thank you for elevating a number of those issues they are important it's part of this discussion um, but I think it's important if we're going to note the marginal increase year over year that in every project we accepted the fact that there are inflationary increases where the dollars don't go as far. And it's only in these level of effort line items which are equally as important, which we have similarly prioritized, where we don't use that same lens. And so it is not a fair apples to apples comparison where the marginal increase probably doesn't even reflect the inflationary increase in the cost that we have allocated to other projects and other places in the CIP and just accepted, you know, there's an increased cost of doing business and we need to make sure that we at least maintain. So I just, I think it's important to bring both of those to light. Uh, they're both legitimate and important parts of the conversation, but things are costing more money now. We are allocating more money just to stay, you know, level of effort uh, to where, you know, we wanted. That's important to do so we don't backtrack, but it also requires additional 
investment. And so, you know, if the goal is to at least maintain the progress that we are making, that we committed to, that would reflect at least a slight increase uh, in the amount. So I just wanted to, to make sure that I uh, noted that. Uh, with that, we have a 3 nothing recommendation to restore Tier 1, recognizing that this is part of an iterative process with a lot of puzzle pieces that need to fit in together, but I think it reflects the longstanding commitment that this committee and the predecessor to this committee has placed in parks and restoring the parks cuts and understanding that while it makes up a, a single digit percentage of the overall capital budget and geo bond obligations, our parks play a much bigger role in our quality of life and our economic development and our equity and inclusion goals. And uh, we very much appreciate that. We'll continue to, to, to advocate for it. So with that, I do we have other items? We have uh, one let more. me turn it over to council staff to walk us through that final item. Uh, it's just a, a circling back to the discussion about the transferring right. from the MCDOT PDF to a MNC PPC Parks PDF, uh, the, the road issue. I'll turn that over to the Parks Director. So uh, we had requested um, a transfer of the Parks Road PDF from the counties, uh, from the DOT CIP back over to our COP, uh, CIP as part of this cycle. And that request um, uh, did not come through with the county executive's proposed CIP. So we wanted to raise that issue with this committee in the hopes that we can get a recommendation from the committee to effectuate that transfer. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, please. Well, and we, we sent a letter over, I believe, late last week kind of enumerating the reasons why we requested the transfer. It's neutral in terms of funding. We're not asking for an increase in funding. So it's a shifting of geo bonds from uh, DOT's budget over to ours. Um, and we made that request because the original impetus for moving the Parks Road PDF out of the parks budget to the DOT budget was in order to take advantage of increased efficiencies resulting from the size of DOT's uh, road maintenance contract. That is no longer, that's essentially a moot issue now because we have a rider on their contract, so we get the same unit price contract for our road work as they do. So that reason for managing this out of DOT's uh, budget no longer exists, and there are a number of other reasons why it's much more efficient if we have one set of staff implementing these projects as opposed to two sets of staff in two departments. And I, I, I described um, some of these reasons in a little more detail, but I don't want to belabor it. I just want to leave it there, but I'm happy to answer um, questions from the committee on this. Any comments or concerns from the executive branch? Vivian Nicole, OMB. Uh, so, um, as Mili said, we uh, will get back to the council staff in terms of the decision that will be made. But we just received the letter, and uh, the CE is going to make his um, decision on that next with next year's budget. So, your recommendation is that we hold off and allow the executive to make a decision next year? Is that the. Yeah, yes, because uh, the executive hasn't really you know, understood. We're still trying to understand conceptually the impact of transferring uh, the PDFs to, back from DOT back to um, uh, park and planning. Uh, well, we have to make a decision on this year's budget. So, while we're waiting for the county executive to make his decision for next year's budget, uh, could we request that the executive weigh in? On this and you know express any concerns I would suggest from the council's perspective on the decision that we have to make this does impact another committee's jurisdiction and so we're suggesting moving it to our committee's jurisdiction but from another committee's and in, in deference to the fact that we all have roles here um, I think we need to loop the transportation and environment committee into this I think that would be the appropriate thing to do so I think we have time uh, a reasonable amount of time, maybe uh, a week or two, to hear from the uh, executive branch. But I would suggest that council staff work with, uh, you know, TNE staff, and we figure out the appropriate way, either a joint committee or, you know, we take this up. I'm personally 
conceptually comfortable with this, but I think we need to you know, think through on the t and &E side. We need to hear from the executive if there are any uh, concerns. I, I, I do think we need to decide this budget, not wait till uh, next budget, unless there are specific concerns that are being raised of a potential problem or impact that it would have. But we need to hear that specifically sure. from the executive. Sure. I mean, we just received the letter. So we will get back to the to staff, to the council staff, and, and see w how, how it's going to be the process to do the transfer and if, it's, if there is and the opinion on, on the transfer. I, I haven't seen the letter, but, I but, but it was received recently, so I, we have to look at it. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, we want to give you a reasonable amount of time to review yeah. it and to give us feedback. I think that's yeah. reasonable. Um, I do think we're going to, you know, want to make a decision unless there are concerns about doing it this year versus next year that we need to specifically hear back on. Uh, and ultimately, I do think that we need to, uh, you know, come up with a, a process to weigh this with our T and E colleagues. So why don't we defer that decision? Come up with a process. Uh, that uh, includes the committees of jurisdiction, whether we have separate conversations uh, or whether we have a joint conversation, we potentially could loop it into another existing joint conversation that perhaps we have on the schedule, but we can take a look at that and think through it and then uh, invite the Parks Department back. And by that time, hopefully we will have some feedback from the executive branch on uh, whether or not they would support it or if they have any concerns with it, uh, both on the substance and on the timing. Um, with that, I think that's all we have today uh, on this particular item. So we are going to shift gears. So thank you to the chair of the Park and Planning Commission uh, on the Montgomery County side, the Planning Board, uh, and to the Parks Department. Thank you to colleagues. Thank you to the Executive Branch for joining us and for getting the feedback uh, we've requested. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Now we're going to switch gears to the second item on our agenda, Zoning Tax Amendment. 2401 household living civic and institutional uses also known as the faith zta uh, look forward uh, to this discussion want to welcome uh, vice president stewart who's here with me and who uh, she and i together uh, move this forward and are the uh, co-lead sponsors and uh, have i will say very proudly the uh, full support of our colleagues, which we very much appreciate. This was introduced on January 16th uh, and would allow for uh, places of religious assembly and educational institutions to be able to build affordable housing that we desperately need to be able to leverage their private resources for public benefits and public goods so that mission-based organizations can help to make a meaningful dent in the mission that they have and in the public good and the public goals uh, that we share to tackle uh, some of our significant uh, housing goals. We have a number of modest amendments that fulfill really the, uh, the spirit of this, uh, some thoughtful suggestions from the planning department and from some external stakeholders, which we very much appreciate. I want to particularly thank Ms. Nadu, uh, who along with the Stewart office team, uh, and, you know, really played a huge role in, in my team as well, Cindy Gibson on on my staff uh, as well. I uh, just want to uh, thank Cecily and, and, and Paul uh, and, and, uh, and the entire Stewart team. And I just really want to thank the faith community uh, who has really stepped up and really been thoughtful partners in how we leverage this forward. And I'll just lastly say I think this is you know, in many ways the next frontier in a multifaceted approach to addressing our housing challenges. We took significant efforts to try to facilitate how do we leverage housing on county-owned land and public resources on metro property? Uh, and this really is focusing on uh, these uh, places of worship and educational uses. So with that, let me turn it over to my co-lead sponsor, Vice President Stewart, for some comments, and then we can get into the heart of the packet. Thank you. Uh uh, Council President Friedson, I, I think um, you covered it um, all, but I do want to thank, um, again, my team and your team for their work in this, and Ms. Nadeau for her incredible work on this. Um, as, uh, as I was warned when we started this, doing a zoning text amendment <laughs> is no easy feat, uh, but I do think it is a testament to um, the work of our, our collaboration between our two offices, working with the faith community, with housing advocates, with the planning department, and 
and having the um, incredibly brilliant mind of Ms. Nadeau on this that what we have before us today are just some um, amendments to help us clarify um, the intent of the zoning text amendment. Um, and I will say that if people want more information about, you know, what's going on, not just here in Montgomery County, but around the country, Washington Post did a nice job in their metro section this weekend, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, calling upon local governments to change their zoning laws to allow this to happen more frequently. And, um, well, we're doing that here in Montgomery County. So um, I thank you all for uh, the work today and look forward to moving this forward. Thank you for that. I just also wanted to know, we had a, a great conversation uh, with Pastor Will Ed Green, who, who facilitated it in uh, Silver Spring and uh, really reflected his leadership and the faith community's broader leadership with uh, many faith leaders talking about what this would do and how organizations and communities could benefit uh, from this and just want to acknowledge his leadership and his partnership uh, with us and, and all the work that, that he has done and the community around that church that has really embraced uh, that this change and I hope will be one of many examples of church communities that look forward to taking advantage of this, along with other faith-based organization, mission-based organization, educational uh, institutions who would take advantage of it as well. So with that, uh, welcome back to the chair of the planning board. Welcome to Mr. Berbert uh, from the planning department and Ms. Nadu from council staff. I also want to acknowledge our housing guru, Ms. Cavoni, uh, in the back. And we uh, also have uh, Department of Permanent Services here uh, as well to answer any uh, questions, uh, comments, or concerns. And with that, why don't I turn it over to you, Ms. Nadu, and you can walk us through the packet. And thank you so much. Uh, Vice President Stewart noted my warning uh, to her as we <laughs> embarked on this, that zoning text amendments take lots of twists and turns. And right when you think you have pulled back every layer, uh, there's always uh, more to the onion. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge and thank you for uh, being our tour guide uh, through the zoning code, <laughs> <Like that. laughs> uh, which uh, is always an interesting uh, 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 journey, but uh, you capably have led us through it. So thank you for that. And with that, let me turn it over to you. Okay. So going through the packet, I'm going to mostly go through it in order today. Um, so first, you'll see the summer, uh, summary of all the testimony on page two, uh, testimony and support noted as the sponsors have stated that there is some excess land that can be used for this affordable housing use. Um, and then a lot of the testimony in opposition focused around environmental concerns and um, having sufficient public amenities in some of these areas. Uh, next up, the impact statements. Uh, planning board unanimously recommended approval with some amendments that I will get to at the end. Um, there was also a climate assessment noting minor negative impacts um, on greenhouse gas emissions and sequestration, partly because there's so much building and development happening. The RESJ impact statement, um, we received that in February. Um, it was an interesting look at, there was a bit of a deep dive into residential segregation and why the residential detached zones were included in this CTA. The idea being, of course, if we increase affordable housing, then we do end up narrowing some of our racial and social inequities, but also paying attention to where we are putting this housing and sort of dividing up the county more. So for the background, as noted, what the ZTA will actually do is allow construction of two types of housing. So first, multi-unit, so those are apartment buildings, and then townhouses um, will be allowed as a conditional use, and if it's associated with educational institution private or with a religious assembly, and then with certain affordability thresholds. If you go to page three of the packet, you'll see the use table, which will show all the zones where these uses are currently allowed and what the CTA focuses on is those residential detached zones. So that's your RE through R40. So as noted, the first thing in the ZTA, uh, pages four through seven, I'm just going to quickly go through each standard that was included in there. There's a lot of moving pieces and going through the correspondence. I think there's a little bit of confusion, so I'm going to go through some of it. Um, first, that this is going to be a conditional use. Um, and next, that the two uses that are going to be able to do this are private schools and religious assembly. So the definitions here are private education, educational institution private is a private school, educational or training academy, academy providing instruction or programs of learning. So not our public schools, just private schools. 
And then second, for the religious assembly use, which I will note is permitted by right in most zones, um, it's a meeting area for religious practices and includes churches, synagogues, mosques, convents, and monasteries, um, and it also includes memorial gardens. So whether a property is going to be used for a private school or religious assembly will be a determination that OZA will make when they get that application. Um, I've spoken to the hearing examiner, and they've noted that they would defer to DPS if there were questions here. Um, and in speaking to DPS, they confirmed that they would decide this based on existing permits, inspecting the property, the history of the use, SDAT information. And I note all of that because religious assembly is permitted by right, they didn't always go through planning. They might not have gone through OZA. They might not even have a building permit. So we'll need different ways to verify that that use exists. Um, next, because this ZTA is allowing two types of housing in zones where it's not normally permitted, we had to come up with all new development standards. And what we used here was a ZTA done I think two years ago now, to allow senior housing to build multi-unit in some of these zones. So we looked at some of those standards to make it similar and keep things consistent. Uh, so first, for the maximum height, the maximum height is 60 feet. Uh, doing a little bit of a flipping through the zoning code, it's sort of the average in all the different zones, so that's why that was chosen as a reasonable number. And again, it was 60 feet for that senior housing use. Uh, next up, the R30 zone was chosen for the principal building setbacks. Um, again, because it's a multi-unit zone, but it's not our densest one, so it's something reasonable to put in these residential detached areas. And lastly, I received an interesting question about this one, about common open space, because it does actually have a very specific definition in the zoning ordinance. So it's an outdoor area intended for recreational use by residents and their visitors, and it does include conservation area, recreational spaces, water bodies, and utilities. Um, so it sort of protects that pervious surface area. And on page five, I have examples of the percentage required in all the different zones. For this ZTA, 35% was chosen as a reasonable standard for requiring open space. Um, next, as noted, residential estate zones were included for those RESJ reasons, um, but there was a concern raised that you want to make sure you have public facilities for, this, for the potential growth you'll get from the ZTA. So there is language about water and sewer access. Um, there is a proposed amendment, which I will get to next. Um, lastly, the affordability threshold. So the council passed ZTA 2302 in July of last year. Um, that set out basically four different affordability thresholds. So the developer can pick any one of those and they would qualify to do this development. And then lastly, because um, you probably noticed, missing from these standards are things like parking, height, lot coverage, density, all of that the hearing examiner will have flexibility in determining. Um, because the CTA affects so much of the county, different sizes, different zones, it allows the hearing examiner to sort of determine what works, what works best on each site. So that is multi-unit living. Uh, next up, townhouse living does have very similar standards in the ZTA. What I want to flag here that I go into some detail on on pages six and seven is there are already townhouse living allowed in some of these residential zones, but usually under two different methods. So it can be limited use if there's some NPDUs, um, for example, the R200 and R40, if you have an MPD, you can do townhouses. Um, and then separately, there's the Design for Life initiative that the council did before my time here, actually. Um, and that's about accessible homes. So right now, in everything but the RE2, um, a property owner can already use all of those standards, and that's where you find that language about being their transit minimum site acre, um, those requirements. So the way the ZTA was written is introduced, since the idea was we have these properties who want to build housing and can't, they currently could under Design for Life and those other MPDU standards, but where they could not was RE2, so that's what was included in the ZTA. I will note there is an amendment to change that coming up later. So some of the, that's the ZTA itself. So some of our big picture questions raised. Um, so first, as noted, this has been done in many other jurisdictions, um, specifically California and Washington State have done similar legislation recently. A uh, second question that has been asked uh, pretty frequently is how tax exemption will work. I hate to go full lawyer on this one. 
I and OCA agree that probably the housing will not be tax exempt. The way the state law is written, it says if the property is used exclusively for religious worship, parsonage, or educational purposes. Unfortunately, neither I nor OCA nor you get to have the final say. It's ESTAT who's actually going to make the decision here. Um, and it will be up to the applicant to work through those issues. Um, you can get to ESTAT numbers, so you'd be able to separate out not having to pay for the religious portion, but paying for the housing. So, sorry, it's not the best answer, but reading case law in the history of how this has been interpreted, most likely the housing would not be tax exempt. Yeah, just to clarify on that, there is a difference between like a seminary, for instance, which is housing to support a religious purpose versus a commercial use, which is housing for, for rent to the broader public. So, you know, I, I just I want to separate those two things because it doesn't mean all housing on all places of worship would be taxed. That's not true. But in this case, to build rental housing, affordable rental housing on even if it's mission based, which it will be in this case, uh, it's it's being rented to the broader public, not for the express purpose of advancing religious purposes, which we, you know, is tax exempt under federal law. And also we. Uh, you know, can't regulate. Uh, we can't prevent. Uh, you know, under the Constitution, we're constitutionally prohibited from, you know, preventing an, an organization from exercising their free expression of religion. So. so next up was a question about what happens if the private school or the religious use goes away. The idea be here being you have a property, there's a church, they build this housing, but one day the church goes away. So the way that this works in the zoning ordinance is that would become a legal non-conforming use because now they're not meeting one of the base requirements. The most important caveat here is that non-conforming uses cannot be expanded so that housing would be able to have renovations and alterations and DPS would determine when you've moved from a renovation to expansion. Um, so I did just want to flag that these multi-unit and townhouse living aren't going to be able to expand if the church or the private school um, no longer exists or goes defunct. Uh, next up for the parking requirement. Um, so the way parking works, if you have multiple uses, is you do the amount required for every single use. But there is a way through DPS where you can do a shared agreement where you can get a reduction because you're doing multiple uses and you fill out a form and meet some standards and DPS usually allows that. But on top of that, because this is conditional use, the hearing examiner can also provide some flexibility. Um, and then lastly, for the big issues raised on this top of page nine, is there is a question about concurrent applications. So if there's an empty lot that has neither a church or a private school on it that wants to use this use, um, you'd have, you do have to have the private school and the religious assembly to have the housing. And the tricky part here is usually the church would be permitted by right, the school has its separate <laughs> um, approval system, and then they also have this housing piece going to OZA. In speaking to the different departments and agencies involved, they would allow a concurrent review and talk to each other. So that's the answer there. And next up, I'll go to amendments, unless there's any questions. Uh, no questions. Let's go to amendments. I just uh, wanted to note uh, 2302, uh, was the zoning text amendment to accelerate affordable housing projects that I introduced with Lorianne Sales that was approved by the council and the uh, assisted living uh, was a zoning text amendment that Sydney Katz and I introduced in the previous council to try to provide more opportunities for community members to age in community. A lot of community members want to age in place, but some community members want a different housing type. And historically, we had housing that, you know, for assisted living and for others, that were really only multi-unit and to, to provide different housing types for those type of age restricted. So I just wanted to explain where that came from and we really utilize both of those prior efforts in order to provide some uh, guidance for consistency across the board for some of these housing efforts. So I just wanted to make sure that that was noted and explained for those who are, have not followed every uh, twist and turn of our progress over the last five years on housing where we've done quite a bit. With that, let's get to the amendments. 
Okay, so middle of page nine, um, the first is a council staff recommended amendment. Um, as originally written, it said this may include contiguous properties separated by a right of way. There's already a word for that, it is confronting. So the amendment here is to say this may include confronting and abutting properties. Technical change without objection, we will accept that, okay. Uh, next is a recommendation from the planning board. So as I noticed, oh, sorry, noticed, as I noted, uh, townhouse living was only added to the RE2 zones for these underlying uses um, because design for life standards and other types of standards existed. Planning board made a recommendation that council staff does agree with to go ahead and allow um, this ZTA to apply in all the residential detached zones, even if they had those other options, because that just provides a bigger menu for doing affordable housing. This simplifies it. Appreciate the suggestion from the planning board, supported by the two sponsors. And yeah. uh, let me uh, turn it over to Council Rodrando. Yeah, supported, and also just want to note that some a lot of these zones tends to be in more affluent areas as well. So it's an equity issue to make sure that we are allowing this in every community as well. So just really glad we're yeah, including Yeah, appreciate that. it. I just want to clarify. We were allowing it in every zone. It was that just that there were different standards in some zones you could do design for life and in others you had lining it up. different standards. So this would just make it across the board. And as noted previous in the packet, the really important point that you lifted up, which I appreciate, this question of RE zones, which tend to be larger properties in some of the more affluent areas, that was very intentional inclusion uh, in, in, in this uh, because of the very issues that you address. So thank you for, for lifting that out. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Vice I was President gonna mention Stewart. this before and I just I do want to say thank you to our, our staff that worked on the racial equity and social justice impact statement because we did have them review an earlier draft of this and that was actually some of the feedback we got from them. So I just I do want to lift that up because it was a very important piece of this uh, ZTA for us. Thank you. All right. So without objection we will accept that planning board suggestion which aligns with the intention of the zoning text amendment is introduced. So with that, let's continue. So next up is clarifying the water sewer restriction. So as introduced, a uh, property that needed an upgrade to the service line or installation of a pump station um, would not be able to utilize the CTA. That was responding to the idea that we want the, wa the correct water sewer infrastructure for someone to start building um, apartments and townhouses in these zones. Um, after reviewing the ZTA, um, planning actually has suggested amended language here. Um, the idea is that, I'll do a little mini water sewer lesson. So we have private institutional facilities um, that get that water sewer approval approved by council, reviewed by DEP. So those properties, it's called the PIF. So the PIF determination specifically says it's for this use, it's for this church. So what this amendment is doing is clarifying that you can't use that approval to use that water and sewer for the housing, like that it was for a specific purpose and you can't now just expand that purpose. So the proposed language here would be on bottom of 11 to say, if the property received access uh, via PIF determination, the site must be served by existing infrastructure that won't require upgrades. Council staff actually, apologies, reviewing it this morning has a, some slightly simpler language if planning believes it still meets the intent, which would just be the site must not receive water and sewer access subject to a PIF determination. I assume we'll write out PIF, uh, yes. private institutional facilities. <laughs> Uh, any comments from Mr. Berbert? Uh, ben Berbert, for the record from the planning department, um, I think we support the change. The intent here is, I think, now more clearly stated that PIF was not to be a means of saying you have water and sewer access, because that inherently is saying you are still outside the water and sewer envelope. Um, and so I think the proposed language, Mr. Dewey's proposed, is the clearest way of saying just that. Yeah. The goal here is not to have a backdoor into changing the sewer envelope or into, um, you know, doing things other than what the intention is here. So uh, there's consensus that was the intention as we moved it forward. This is a clarification uh, on, on that, and I think the updated language seems to reflect that. So without objection, we will take the council staff's recommended implementation of the planning board recommendation for the language, as you just described. We good on that? Does that yes. reflect what you were looking for? Okay, great. Let's continue. 
So the next amendment, um, and this one is a recommend that council staff does not recommend at this time. A lot of the advocates, re advocates requested site plan review instead of conditional use. Uh, first, I want to note that a lot of these projects would have had to go through site plan review anyways. Um, so this is very exciting for me because this is a rehash of my law school property law class. Um, but So site plan and conditional use are different prop processes with different purposes. So as defined in the zoning ordinance, site plan gives a detailed overview of the development. Make sure you satisfy all of our development laws and regulations. Conditional uses are presumed valid unless certain conditions can't be met and it's typically a pretty high bar so the basically the argument that it'll be easy for an opponent to say well this isn't compatible here so you can't allow it typically wouldn't work because as soon as the council says something is conditional use hearing examiners are supposed to assume it's valid unless there's something weird about this site um, so that's the sort of background on how conditional uses work and some case law on that um, the second argument weighed was that conditional use process is subject to appeal. Planning board decisions are also subject to appeal. Um, so that applies in both instances. Um, and then the last argument was that the hearing examiner must consider compatibility. And so because you're putting these in zones with single family, they'll never meet that threshold. But similarly, the planning board is subject to the master plans, which historically wouldn't say that you could have this housing there. So the arguments end up coming out almost equal and I think for this CTA in particular where you have two different uses on a wide variety of zones on a wide variety of sites conditional use is particularly appropriate here and then so the advocates are not angry at me I do want to note that conditional use could actually be great for them here because you can say I would actually like less parking because of the way this site is designed I actually would like to move things like have a driveway in a separate spot so there's the density and the height and all of those things that the hearing examiner can set conditions and be really flexible about that might actually be a benefit of conditional use in this instance over site plan so that is my I'll jump off my soapbox now yeah, I'll just speak for myself. I agree and support the staff recommendation that while I certainly appreciate where advocates are coming from to try to do as many things by right as possible to make the process as easy as possible, and we have been taking extraordinary efforts to do that. The aforementioned zoning text amendment on affordable housing specifically does that, reducing the regulatory review process by 75 percent. The planning department has been moving forward with expedited review in, in general. We have lots of different areas that we've tried to address this. The council just approved a conditional use improvement uh, and uh, a process change to make the conditional use process easier and more efficient and move several aspects to limited use. Uh, uh, that would you know be appropriate for that. that one of the challenges here, as, as noted, is um, many of these properties are unique properties, and for us to create standards that would be one size fit, fits all would be very difficult to do, and I think would make this extremely challenging to move forward. Uh, by moving it forward in the way that we have, I think we've struck the appropriate balance of signifying these projects should be moving forward noting what standards uh, should be used at a high level, but allowing for a case-by-case -case approach to be able to address some of the standards, because some of those standards will be too rigid and will need to be more flexible. Some of them may need to be reinforced because of the unique uh, challenges. So I appreciate that. I think we'll get to the compatibility question in an amendment uh, coming forward, which I very much support, uh, and I do think goes in tandem with this recommendation and is part of the reason why I think this is uh, the right recommendation, but I just wanted to, to note that. I don't know if anybody else has any no, comments. Let me turn it over to Vice President Stewart. Thank you. I just want to um, echo the sentiment that I really appreciate the advocates who brought this to us. And uh, Ms. Nadu, thank you so much for your very clear um, description of this because um, we have a housing crisis, and that's why we're doing this work right now um, and we need to make sure that we are facilitating the building of housing um, but I agree with the council president and the advice from council staff that um, the way we have it in the ZTA is the, appro uh, the appropriate approach okay without well there, there's no amendment here so we're gonna we agree with council recommendation but no change or vote necessary uh, let's continue 
So that is a great segue to the compatibility requirements. Um, the request here is to amend the language. So existing in the zoning ordinance in the conditional use section is some language about compatibility. But in this section of the ZTA, it's actually a little more like specific and fine-tuned. And so on this one, council staff agrees um, with the advocates. And the suggested language is to say the hearing examiner may modify the height, density, coverage, and parking standards to be compatible with surrounding uses. And then strike the sentence that says may modify development standards to maximize compatibility of the building with residential character of the neighborhood. And this language is at the top of page 13. Yeah, appreciate this. Uh, I will say I could speak for both sponsors on this because we discussed this with staff. This is reflective of our intention uh, as we introduce it. I think this language is uh, more uh, appropriate and more reflective of what uh, we uh, would want. I will note that while residential character and neighborhood character is used uh, in many places, it's not something that I am particularly comfortable with given the subjective nature of what neighborhood character means and how it has been used and misused uh, throughout the decades, uh, unfortunately. But compatibility standards are legitimate uh, in, in, in land use. And uh, when used appropriately, when focusing on land use compatibility standards uh, and, and, and others. And so I think the specificity here of what does that mean? What are we talking about in terms of, of it? And I will note, Compatibility standards goes both ways. Uh, adjusting the compatibility standards to reflect uh, the surrounding uses can be restrictive and can be expansive. Uh, and so it does provide the appropriate level of latitude to uh, give that discretion, but to do so in a way that gives clear direction uh, that this should not be used as a way to prevent uh, housing. The goal here is to increase housing. So with that, yep. without objection, we will accept that amendment. So the next amendment, uh, we're back to planning board recommendations, is to increase the side setback to 25 feet. It was originally 20 feet. This is the setback to abutting properties, so not within the site, because again, you might have multiple buildings, but just to those neighboring properties to provide a buffer. 25 feet is what was used in the senior housing ZTA, and it will allow for some landscape screening if needed. So council staff agrees with this one. Without objection, agreed. The next amendment from the planning board is to require eligible sites to be a quarter mile from a public bus route. Uh, council staff does not recommend this amendment, uh, mostly for the reasons noted in the RESJ statement about residential segregation and where this would sort of force housing to develop. Yeah, I'll just note this was done very intentionally. Uh, this was something that we very much took a look at. In fact, uh, as uh, Vice President Stewart and I were really diving into the details of this with council staff, with planning, we, we looked at maps. We looked at where would be included, what parts of the county would be uh, included in that. And in the decisions that we made, not just in the zones, but in the transit proximity, which tends to be our focus, uh, we very much viewed this as an important part of the racial equity piece, that it would restrict parts of the county where we need mixed income housing the most and where we see the greatest opportunity for some of the significant social benefits on this. And I think the racial equity social justice statement spoke to that. The RE zones are part of that. And this particular issue is part of it, too. So with that, let me turn it over. Uh, let me turn it over to Councilmember Joanda. Thank you. Um, we heard some testimony in the public hearing about a related point in this, about uh, I think about the highway to heaven in particular, in that uh, New Hampshire Avenue, which I live off of, where there are many, many churches, so I'm going to heaven, I hope. Um, and it is a, I do want to give, uh, while I, I understand that why it was intentionally not put in, I do want to uplift a concern that is a real concern in this instance, that if you look, I've looked at the maps, because I, I, I know all the churches. We, we, we had an intentional outreach plan to go to as many churches as possible, so I know where they are. There are a lot of them in parts of the county, particularly East County and other places, where there has been historical reasons why development hasn't happened. Um, and there is uh, a really, this came up in the context of Thrive, that 
if we're going to increase development, we want to make sure that we're also seeing a commensurate increase in amenities and business activity for folks that live near that and that they can get around and, and get to uh, all those places. Um, that being said, we need we do need more housing everywhere. We know where the housing is more affordable because we are still segregated, unfortunately, de facto uh, segregated in that we have, and it's largely done by housing price. The places where it's going to be most affordable to do this are going to tend to be in places where the land is cheaper. Um, and so we have a conundrum. So it's it's not we can't solve everything in one ZTA. Um, so we need more housing, but we also need to take this as, I think, a cautionary uh, and a motivation to us to say, what are we doing to make sure that we're ensuring uh, in the requirements that we have with the levers that we have, realizing we don't have all the levers, that we're incentivizing uh, not only affordable housing, but increased transit access, uh, increased walkability, livability, increased commercial activity, and the like. So um, I, I appreciate planning making this recommendation um, and I would while I appreciate also the the main sponsors we're all co-sponsors I think it's the whole 11 councils so we're all we're all co-sponsors of the of the ZTA it would be um, interesting to explore down the line and if you want to say anything now you can where this came from and did you look at your own maps and what you base this upon? Am, am I am I on base at all? Am I off base, or, or what were you looking at? And maybe it's something that we probably should come back to and talk about in the context of implementing Thrive, because it is a, as someone who lives in one of these areas, it is something you hear uh, and you experience about wanting this accessibility. So. Right. I, I appreciate the question. Um, I think the reason we did make the recommendation is, you know, Thrive wants more housing. It wants more affordable housing. But we really, Thrive really is looking for it to be in complete communities, the 15-minute communities, walkability, and to have it where there is a reasonable expectation that somebody can walk to, take transit, or at least get to amenities or jobs without relying on a vehicle. And, you know, I appreciate the argument that most people have vehicles, and that's great, but I think, you know, we're planning for a future where vehicles are not as necessary, but we're potentially saying in some of these areas that don't have transit access, it is necessary there. And so, you know, we weren't looking at this as any particular zone. Um, we just think quarter mile to a, a bus. And, and I, we did map this. Um, the original actual recommendation from planning staff was it should be adjacent to a, a bus line. Um, by expanding it to a quarter mile, 86% of churches and 95% of private schools are in the, the boundary that's captured by this. There's only a very small number of things that 86 percent of of churches. Churches and 95% of, of the private schools would be included with this amendment. Or within a quarter mile of, of a bus line. So it, in some ways it's an insignificant change, but we just feel like for the support of Thrive, it was a recommendation we wanted to make. Yeah, uh, Artie Harris, uh, Planning Board Chair. Yeah, it was when the, the planning staff came to us, they wanted it on a street uh, that was, you know, adjacent to the street with the property, and we we thought that was was potentially too restrictive, and so we said within a quarter mile because it could be on the side, you know, a cross street. But we understand about the balancing because we were also thinking of an equity. But we understand that uh, what you're saying that there are many communities, higher end communities, that may not have these bus stops, but they should still have affordable housing. We're all about accelerating the growth of affordable housing in the county. So we we understand where you're coming from, and uh, we're we're okay if it did not have uh, within a quarter mile. But well, but I just want to give you why we said we all were sure. thinking, also thinking about an equi equity piece and how people have transportation, but we understand that those probably will be, that they won't be the significant number in those areas, but the, the more significant will be in areas where there are probably will be more transportation opportunities. So um, appreciate we, that. We would be okay without. So I'm, yeah, I'm gonna we, go. Go along with the colleagues. There's not an amendment before us, so we don't have to. It's not. No one's proposed it, right? This is a suggestion from planning, right? Yes, so there's, it was no, there's no motion for an amendment. I would love. To, so we're just gonna. I'm fine with moving on. I would love to see, unless I don't think it's in the packet. I was looking, where, what those areas are. It's not in the packet because if you know, my colleagues were saying here, which I agree. 
if it's 86 and 95, it doesn't have a huge impact on the on the ZTA. But there are some communities that would be excluded, and I want to know where they. I think before we would before anyone should consider any amendment like that, you should know which communities are excluded. Um, one thing I can definitely do is make sure Ms. Nadu has access to that map. So I was crunching the numbers this morning. Um, what I'll say preliminarily is it actually is sort of all over the place that areas are included and excluded. Um, if, if there was a biggest area of exclusion, it actually is Norwood Road going out towards, uh, was that Blake High School? Which is off the, on the high, off of the highway to heaven. It's one of the adjacent, it's an artery to the highway to heaven. That's, that's probably the biggest area that I saw. There was a concentration of, of religious institutions that would not be able to take advantage of the ZTA. Um, most of the other ones in the estate zones actually were still counted because most of the institutions are along our major transportation okay. corridors anyway. Um, and then similarly, there are a number of small neighborhood churches that are deep in neighborhoods that just don't have transit access even in down county that would potentially be excluded if this were to be adopted. And again, I can I can I, yeah, so let's, up I would that. love to see that map as we head into full council. We don't do anything right now, but I think that's irrelevant. Uh, it's it'd be interesting to see. So thank you. OK, great. Not before us. I will note uh, as well, when we talk about complete communities, and bus lines and access to bus lines, we choose where the bus lines are. So part of the decision of where the bus lines are is where the need is and where the people are and where the housing is. So uh, there is an amenity piece to this, but there's also a transit piece to this. And particularly when it comes to bus lines and local bus lines, those are our decisions. And I think it's important we're gonna to get to this next by uh, expanding this potentially with a potential amendment. But every one of these projects has to meet affordability thresholds. So, um, you know, we, we need more of those opportunities, not fewer, and we need them countywide, as was noted by Councilmember Jawando and, uh, and, and by others. So, uh, okay, no uh, amendment being offered here by colleagues. Let's move on to our final item. And I will just note that when I get that map, it will be in the full council packet. I'll make sure it's included. Uh, so the next amendment uh, recommended by Planning Board is to include 4% LIHTC. That's the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. So there's basically two buckets um, of LIHTC. There's the 9% tax credit and the 4% tax credit. Uh, the 9% is for new construction and substantial rehabilitation, and the 4% is for new construction that uses additional subsidies um, for that rehabilitation. Historically in ZTAs, um, the council has only included the 9%, um, but despite that, council staff does recommend um, including the 4% LIHTC projects for the CTA um, just to increase the amount of affordable housing the county has. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'll just note the two uh, previous items, because I was the lead sponsor of both, um, or one of the two lead sponsors of both. Um, it was to prioritize. We, we were providing, in one case, 100% property tax credit automatically without any discretion, and the other we were offering expedited review. That is an aggressive expedited review. And the interest was to make sure that these were the most prioritized affordable housing projects, of which 9% competitive tax credit projects are the most prioritized, uh, most deeply affordable, most significant affordable housing projects that we have. This, because it is different, it just is to meet affordability thresholds, 4% tax credit, LIHTC deals are great deals and are actually the most common uh, in many cases of the uh, property tax deals. So I just wanted to explain the reason why before there was a real interest in ensuring that we were appropriately prioritizing to make sure it was the most affordable, most deeply affordable projects that met affordability thresholds that we knew we wanted to provide that extra level of prioritization. In this case, it's a really a different standard uh, in terms of uh, prioritization. We're here, we just want to make sure that these projects are advancing our affordable housing goals and that we want to broaden the tent to the extent uh, appropriate. So I, I'm supportive of adding the, the 4%. I just wanted to provide the, the context. It wasn't a mistake or an oversight in previous efforts. It's just that the, the goals here are a bit different uh, than the goals uh, in the other two items that we included. And I think in this particular case, uh, it is absolutely appropriate to include the 4% uh, tax credits. All right, so without objection, we'll accept that uh, as well, uh, unless there are any uh, additional amendments or comments 
from colleagues. I will express my appreciation uh, again to my co-lead sponsor, Vice President Stewart, who really has, uh, along with her team, carried much of the load uh, on this. And uh, it's been a great partnership, and I'm very grateful and appreciative of it. Uh, thank you to council staff, Ms. Nadu. Thank you to planning. Uh, and uh, look forward to recommending this to the full council. So all in favor of moving this forward as amended to the full council, raise your hand. And that is 3 nothing approved. And we will move this along to the full council with a recommendation for approval for Zoning Text Amendment 2401. Yay. And with that, we are adjourned. Yay.